and welcome to the Healthy Half Hour Podcast. We are your hosts, Richard and Karen Inslee. The Healthy Half Hour Podcast is your resource for all things healthy, and we will be discussing how to make nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle choices work for you. We will be sharing our own personal insights along with research gathered from working in the health and fitness industry for the past 10 years. Our show is brought to you by The 7 Day Shred, which can be found at 7dayshred.com. And please feel free to visit our podcast website, which can be found at healthyhalfhourpodcast.com. And now on to today's show. we're back i know we've had a bit of a hiatus is it hiatus is that a missing in action thing i think so yeah <laughs> um or low atus knowing us yeah we've um well we've not been away anywhere but we just obviously have had things to do around the house and the garden over the summer so our regular podcasts have been put on hold we've been doing some interviews which you've probably been listening to we've got a couple more interviews to do as well but we'll interject them along our regular weekly podcasts that we normally do. I'm Just wanted... some scheduling issues at the minute with people are busy and some people are out of town, so we'll, we'll get them picked up at some point. And one of the interviews uh, well, we're going to be doing is Richard Lannan. He works for CGOB here, the radio station in Winnipeg, and he runs his own company, Set for Success, and he interviews people on his show. And he interviewed me a couple of weeks ago and apparently went out on the radio on Saturday. So if the link's up, I'll get you to put it onto the show notes at the end. But if not, then we'll just tag it somewhere anyway. Just um, Richard just interviewed me. I think it was my fourth time on his, pod, on his um, radio show. But he's had his own health issues in the past. And he said to me, he says, I interview lots of people and nobody interviews me. So um, be interesting for you guys to listen to my interview with him. And then we're excited to have him back. But again, he's a busy guy as well. So hopefully we can get back to some routine and get the other interviews um like put in them put in before christmas well <laughs> give ourselves lots of time no 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 because then like we will we'll leave it to the last minute if we say that true <laughs> so today's podcast we're gonna go over diet and exercise myths because as always again as is with the internet there's uh, 20 websites that'll tell you one thing and 20 websites that'll tell you the other and on social media whether it's instagram facebook twitter tumblr whoever there's always these little memes going around that tells you this that and the other and to be honest with it a lot of it is just basic garbage so we're going to go over some of those myths today some of them we may have covered in previous episodes just as a snippet of certain things but yeah we're going to pick a few off today again just to get us back into the the swing of podcasting again after our little like karen says summer hiatus time and so we're going to start out with basically a calorie is a calorie. So again, well, is it? Uh, no. <laughs> <clears throat> so you'll see a lot of times again, people will tout these different things and have 100 calorie snack bars and this and that and the other. And people always, again, assume that a calorie is a calorie when it really isn't. From a, a caloric point of view, a calorie is is a calorie i don't want to confuse you 100 calories is 100 calories it is but your body processes and metabolizes it differently it depends and it's always the question is 100 calories of what so again the body will treat 100 calories of fat 100 calories of carbs and 100 calories of protein or 100 calories of mixtures of all three differently so if it's a high carb low fat higher moderate protein 100 calories compared to a lower the opposite way around so a higher protein or a higher uh, fat 100 calories or just 100 calories of pure of each one your body will react differently to it so a calorie really isn't a calorie when it comes to uh, how your body actually treats it also a calorie can be absolutely 100 calories of something can be full of nutrients 
or you can have 100 calories of sugar or something processed that's pretty much dead apart from 100 calories. So what your body's going to glean from that 100 calories also makes a difference. So do be aware that calories matter, but what those calories are actually matters even more. And the thermogenic effect of those calories, I mean, out of 100 calories of protein, by the time your body's like broken down those proteins, you're probably assimilating uptake about 75 of those calories. But if you eat 100 calories of carbohydrates and primarily sugars, your body will uptake about 96 of those calories. So there's like almost like 20 calories difference. Um, seven, eight, nine, yeah, 20 calories difference. Good in the, yeah, I know. I'm not good at like simple arithmetic. Give me something complicated. But, but so like, like Richard says, like 100 calories of what really matters. And if it's 100 calories of fat, your body will uptake about 98 of those calories. So if you eat protein, it's about 75 carbs it's 96 fats it's 98 so if you're on a calorie controlled diet it does matter what those calories consist of yeah definitely and like i say they they do matter but again quality over quantity is really the way you way you should look at it so again memes are that you see people in the gym for two hours two and a half hours so you need to do this that and more exercise is always better. It isn't. No, sorry. Oh, Burst oh. your bubble. Oh. And I mean, really, 45 minutes to an hour, if you're doing like specific exercises, is probably more than enough. You can get more everything done in that a period of time. And again, doing more exercise isn't necessarily the better thing because sometimes that can lead to fatigue and lead to injury. And to be honest, a lot of times with our busy lives, we've got better things to do. So even if you looked at your life and thought, I've only got half an hour, it's a waste of time, I'm not doing anything because I need an hour, that's not true. You really, a, a half an hour is good. I had a client in here the other day and I got him to do a 10 minute Tabada and he was absolutely ringing wet and done and we kind of, oh, what are we going to do now? And we did some more things, but on a lower, a lower intensity, but just to prove to him that 10 minutes is really enough and we, as I say we actually uh, did a 10 minute leg one and he was burning by the end of it and he still couldn't walk two days later so again it's adaptation to that 10 minutes of exercise and obviously the more of those 10 minute blocks you do the more you're going to adapt to them but with exercise again doing like I say specific weightlifting and or things like that for, for more than an hour is not necessary but saying that you don't want to be inactive for the other 23 hours a day. So activity more is better, but specific exercise of just uh, doing just certain exercises or certain routines really isn't the best way to go. You, there's better things to do with your time, but obviously walking or stretching or doing other things just in general, like even house cleaning or things where you're actually oh, moving. No, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, okay. I just pull the blinds down, oh. turn the lights off. Yeah, oh. it's way better. Oh, we can't see out the windows anymore. Well, that's fine, yeah. Can't see how dirty the house is. That's a good thing. <laughs> so, again, exercise, be smart about it, do, get done what you've got to get done, but don't take all day over it. And exercise is a stress at the end of the day. It can be a good stress, but there's a lot of people who, not bashing on CrossFit, but there's a lot of people, especially a lot of type A type personalities out there, they just beat the crap out of themselves like at CrossFit multiple times a week, but it is a stress on the body and it might not be what your body needs. So you've got to be very efficient with what you choose. And sometimes, I mean, it's like nutrition, what you like doing might not necessarily be the best for your body. So it's just something to consider. Who's seen eight? You've got to drink eight glasses of water a day. I've just seen that it says eight glasses of wine. Oh, no, it yeah. says water. Oh, I it, think you skipped oh, it begins out. begins with a W. I think you skipped out at the A. <laughs> yeah. So, again, you often see there that people, oh, yeah, you've got to drink eight glasses of water a day. And even local health authorities and doctors' websites and things, they'll quote this number of eight glasses per day. There's a nutritionist in the UK called Zoe Harkham, and she actually went and searched out where this eight glasses of water a day came from, and it came from absolutely nowhere. There's no actual evidence to say you've got to drink eight glasses of water a day. There's nothing specific saying it's this amount of volume of water. So 
yes, drink water, but don't think that you've got to drink eight glasses of water a day. Obviously, it really does matter with hydration and it can affect blood pressure and lubrication in the joints and other things. So it is important to drink good, clean water. But the, the eight glasses thing, eh. If it's a hot day, yes, drink a little more. If it's you're not, if you're not necessarily that thirsty, then your body will tell you, you know, when to actually start drinking. But there's no hard and fast rule that it's got to be eight glasses. And you have to take into account the foods that you're eating. So a lot of the times, people are eating a lot of water-rich foods. So lettuce, cucumbers, like peppers and fruits and other vegetables. We're, we're consuming more water than you actually think if you actually were to be like meticulous and, and there must be some way to calculate exactly how much water is in all the fruits and vegetables and foods we eat. But I'd like say it's it's not necessarily drinking eight glasses of water a day because you are taking water on in other forms. And um, tea and coffee, it's still water. Coffee can be dehydrating, but really at the end of the day, it's still water, herbal teas. So. And do be aware that you can drink too much water. Again, too much of anything isn't good for us. You can actually die from drinking too much water. So again, just be aware if it is a hot day and you are taking extra extra fluids on, remember the electrolytes. So, I mean, add a small, tiny pinch of salt to your water or take an electrolyte tablet like a noon tablet or something. So again, you're just adding those extra electrolytes into that water because again, dehydration can occur not necessarily because you're not drinking enough water, but because your electrolyte levels get low. So again, no hard and fast rule with the eight glasses, but do remain hydrated. Crunches. Uh-oh. Apparently I knew, we, I knew doing, we'd get to the crunch. Doing 500 crunches a day will actually help you to lose body fat and get you a nice flip. Flat belly and ripped abs. Yeah, the amount of people that come up <laughs> saying, oh, my belly's like uh, flabby around the middle. I, re I need loads of core work. Well, yeah, great. You're going to have really nice, firm-toned muscle underneath your fat, but you can't spot reduce body, really? no, body fat from any specific area by doing more around that area. There have been studies that if you do certain exercises in an area then you there is an increased blood flow to that area and that increased blood flow can mobilize more fat from that area but again noticeably not really but again from a from a, a point of view of actually looking at the body from a microscopic level yes it does it does mo mobilize more but you wouldn't really notice so again to lose body fat you need to basically adjust your diet, lifestyle and exercise plan and it will come off. And but I, just to do more crunches in that area won't really help that much. And I found personally that if I do regular crunches, then my belly actually domes. And you've always said to me, do more stabilizing movements like plank and things like that. That's going to be way more beneficial. So for whatever reason um crunches are not effective for me was when it comes to actually like flattening the belly and it is important to uh like you say to keep that core strong and remember your lower back muscles uh your ab muscles they're all in there so it's all part of that core and i mean you don't actually sit there at any point rocking back and forward like you would with doing crunches so like karen says you're better off doing stabilizing exercises that are way more functional that'll actually work better for you and it's again it's not necessarily just the ab muscles at the front it is the back muscles so again it's all part of that core and that a stronger core gives you a better posture being posturally aware can also improve your core because now you're sitting up taller so you're actually utilizing those core muscles instead of just resting your ribs onto your abs and sitting there in that slouch position which again doesn't use those ab muscles in the way they were made to be used and next one, uh, I'm sure that you've all seen these memes on Facebook, social media, advertisements that, oh, eat these five fat burning foods. These will burn fat if you eat them. Hmm. I mean, it's not fat burning coffee either. <laughs> fat burning coffee. Apparently somebody's making good money at selling uh, a product that allegedly uh, is a fat-burning coffee. But just as a useless piece of information, um, caffeine in itself does help to mobilise fat. So anybody selling a product with fancy flavours and other things in it saying that um, 
it burns fat and it's a fat burning product caffeine naturally does that anyway yeah so fat burning foods yeah they don't really exist i mean there are uh, uh, open commas superfoods clothes commas but i mean those superfoods the reason why the superfoods because generally they're very high in nutrients for the dent for the size for how many calories you're getting out of it but when it comes to fat burning yeah it doesn't really help and as richard said i mean a lot of the times nutrient dense foods when you change your diet and start eating differently the more nutrients that you consume in you will end up because uh, you any the end user of food that you put in your mouth is your cells so if you're fueling your body at a cellular level your your body is quite happy so you will naturally not go to those other nutrient depleted foods so when you're eating nutrient dense foods yeah you might see some weight loss and some aesthetic um improvements to the body but it's not because they're fat burning foods it's because you're fueling your body to a cellular level, you're eating nutrient dense, and you don't want the crappy, sugary, processed things. So, like I say, there's no fat burning foods, but there's foods that will promote, like, fueling at a cellular level so that you don't actually start craving other things that are not nutrient, that are nutrient depleted. One big one I often see is that uh, don't run because it's bad for your knees. So the human body was designed so it would break down if you run. Uh, no. Running isn't bad for your knees. Poor running gait isn't great for your knees. Poor running shoes isn't good for your knees. So there's, there's things that can not help, but in itself, running is not bad for your knees. Again, with talking about hydration. So, I mean, if you're hydrated and your food quality is good, so obviously the, the joints are lubed up like they should be, there should be there's no problem with running on your knees and if you do have knee pain uh, when running then more often than not it's a gait issue um, so when I say gait g-a-i-t you can google that and it's basically how your feet hit the floor how your hips work how your ankles work because again humans are st- our joints are stacked up from a mobilizing joint and then we have a stabilizing joint and then a mobilizing joint and a stabilizing joint so What happens is your ankle is a mobilizing joint and your knee is a stabilizing joint and then your hips are a mobilizing joint. So you should have mobility either side of your knees. So if you've got immobility in your ankles or immobility in your hips, then the knee will try and take some of that and actually be trying mobile to compensate. So if you've got poor mobility either side, then that stabilizing joint isn't going to be stabilizing like it should. It's going to be tried to mobile, and that's where you can start to have trouble with your knees. But, I mean, in my experience, no. It's always work on that mobility, and knee pain uh, will just disappear. I had a client this morning, and she's even had, even had operations on one of her knees to try and fix it, and they cut a tendon in her knee to try and realign it again. And we, she came to us, and she's had knee pain since she was a kid, And she's in her mid-40s now. And for the last three years, she's had no knee pain at all. Uh, We worked on a hip mobilization. We worked on doing some strength. And yeah, all her knee pains are gone. And she actually said this morning, she just said, I still can't believe of all the years of crap I went through uh, for no reason. Operations and things. And it was there was nothing wrong with the knees. It was just poor mobility of the hip that, that was basically the problem. So start having a look around don't just where pain manifests itself isn't necessarily the issue but go to a specialist go to someone who knows what they're doing and get it assessed one of the things i often get asked when i'm like running fitness classes is well how do i stretch i thought it was always why you're so tough (laughs) no i'm I'm a pussycat i am i'm a pussycat bad cop i know i'm bad cop you're a good cop well, people will say, like, how do I stretch my knees? How do I exercise my knees? And it's not a case of you you, you really can't, so um, so to speak. But as Richard said, you know, you, you strengthen either side of, like, the knees. You strengthen the muscles around it to, to get more um, function and strength into the actual knees. So they, they function and move easier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ah. Oh, well, I'm going to sp- I'm going to sp- I'm going to spend one sentence on this one and one sentence only. We still see health professionals or we still see people who seem very intelligent people who still say that fat weighs more than muscle. 
Yeah, a pound of fat apparently weighs more than a pound of muscle. They they both weigh a pound. It's just a, like a pound of fat takes up more space. And I did a live video um, on Facebook probably about a year ago. And I started the video and I had, um, oh, I had a big piece of um, styrofoam that must have been about four foot by three foot. I, I had some, I don't know, tool contraption off one of your drills that was like this metal thing that I don't know what it did. I mean, I had, oh, I can't remember. There was about four or five different things and all of them weighed a pound. And I just showed people on the video saying, look at the size of this, look at the size of that. They all weigh a pound. So a pound of fat doesn't weigh more than a pound of muscle. It, they all weigh a pound. It's just that they take up more space. Yes, fat takes up more volume than muscle. So a pound of muscle has less volume than a pound of fat. We're going to leave it there. It's physics. <laughs> Aww. No, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. If I all, oh, Okay. So going back to exercise again, uh, again, I've been in this industry, people come and then the next day you kind of check in with them, how's things? I'm not sore. I obviously didn't have a great workout. I uh, I didn't sweat that much. Obviously, it was I, I didn't get everything I needed out of it. You don't need to sweat and you also don't need to be that sore the next day to have a good workout. Um, tying into this one, the no pain, no gain. Yeah, really? Mm, it depends on the sort of pain. If you're having joint pain and other problems, then yes, you're having issues. If you're having muscle soreness pains, and again, if it's a new exercise or you're using a, the legs or doing something or the arms or the abs, doing something that you've not A, done for maybe a long time or B, never done before because it's a new kind of thing, yes, you're going to end up with some muscle soreness. But just because you've done an exercise or you did a workout routine for 45 minutes or an hour and the next day nothing was sore, it doesn't mean that you didn't get anything from it. It doesn't mean that you didn't push yourself hard enough. You still, your body will still has adapted to what you're doing. So obviously you're maintaining that muscle strength. If you didn't do anything, then the body would de-adapt and you would get weaker. So it's you don't need to get stronger every time. And again, as we get older... Our strength obviously does dwindle, but you need to just keep that strength up as much as you can. So it's not necessary to have that soreness or a big sweat every time you have a workout. And I mean, some of my workouts, I'll just spend 45 minutes doing mobilizing exercises. So, I mean, you're never going to sweat. But I mean, that afterwards, it's again, sometimes I do get that muscle soreness after doing mobilizing now because I'm running the joints through a larger range. Well, I do tell my boot campers to take their cell phone to the washroom the next morning because if they can't get off the toilet after a leg workout that they better text somebody to help them get up <laughs> well we keep talking about putting that in the disclaimer that we're not we're not responsible for putting toilet roll holders back on the wall so <laughs> yeah i do say that i I'll, I'll pimp you out so that you can go and reattach them. Re as long as they're not as long as they're not in the washroom i'm good to go, we're good to go. <laughs> so again with no pain no gain you don't need to uh, it's nice to have a bit of soreness sometimes. And again, it's nice to take the muscles to that point with when you're doing like whatever bicep curls, leg exercises where your legs start to uh, have that bit of pain. But that bit of pain is actually the buildup of lactic acid. So, I mean, that's what you're dealing with. You're not dealing with tearing of muscles or ligaments or tendons or uh, joint issues or anything so again just be smart about it like i say with the other uh, like we said earlier on with exercise you don't need to kill yourself every time to be to be effective and at the moment the ketogenic diet is very very popular and there's some zealots that think that all carbohydrates are bad <gasps> Well, <laughs> no, I mean, like, there's a lot of efficacy for the keto diet. I kind of flip and flop and you do between keto and paleo. We're a whole foods kind of um, formula in our house. But my brother has seen some amazing results from going very low carb and following a ketogenic diet. His um, My brother's name's Chris, and I know he's going to be listening. And his wife... Heather, Shout out for Chris! Yeah, yay, in England. <laughs> so his wife, Heather, reversed her type 2 diabetes by following a ketogenic diet. But at the end of the day, it really is how your body metabolizes and interprets those carbohydrates. When we're talking about carbohydrates being good for you, we're looking at, like, vegetable sources of carbohydrates. I mean... 
We do have some starches in our diet during the week or the weekend. We'll have like, I don't know, maybe a bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwich. And we, we are not gluten intolerant. We can handle some. And our weight and health, body fat is, is pretty stable, pretty healthy. And we do have some, um, starchy carbs in our diet. But the ones that are bad for you are those refined, process carbohydrates the things that you're buying out of a packet and at the end of the day it's how you tolerate them and going into menopause when women start producing less estrogen or manopause uh, manopause yeah traditionally um we need more healthy fats in a diet and a certain amount of starchy vegetables to um produce estrogen or, or to help with the estrogen production. And again, that is very individual as well. I tolerate a higher starch and carbohydrate diet than what you do, but that's just me. So if your body tolerates it, you're at a healthy weight, you don't have any blood sugar dysregulations and your body fat to a good level, then if, if you can tolerate them and you want some in your diet, then... All well and good, but there's a lot, like I say, there's a lot of efficacy for the keto diet, low carb, and it is very beneficial. And again, if nobody's ever explained to, to, to you why, again, processed carbs are bad and like potatoes that aren't necessarily so bad. <gasps> Mashed potatoes, I'm it, never giving them up. It's because, again, anything that's being processed has been run through more often than not a crushing process. So what happens with wheat, they get wheat and they put it through a mill and they crush it down to a fine powder. That fine powder then is reformed using water, eggs and other things to make things like bread. So when you actually eat it, what the body is trying to do is the body has to break it down into its component parts of sugar because that's the part that the body wants to take into the blood. So if you've got a potato that you've cooked and it still looks like a potato, so all those potato all those molecules that go up to make that potato are all nice and tightly bound together. So in the digestive process, it goes into your stomach and the stomach acid in your stomach and the amylase from, the, uh, from your saliva start to break all these molecules apart. And what your body is trying to do is cleave all these mole molecules apart to make the small molecules of monosaccharides, polysaccharides, disaccharides. So just the smaller parts. If it's a potato or a, a piece of squash or something like that or a cabbage, then it takes the body a longer time to actually break them down to absorb them. If it's a processed carb like a piece of bread, then it's already been broken down to it's almost its component parts. It's been crushed into small pieces, so it doesn't take the body as long. If it doesn't take the body as long, it will get absorbed quicker. If it gets absorbed quicker, then you, what your body will do is the blood sugar will rise quickly because it's taken into your blood straight away. If your blood sugar rises quickly, then your body has to produce insulin to lower your blood sugar. So it'll either put the sugar into muscles that need it, or it'll put it into your liver if it needs it. If there's space, if there's no space, it's made into body fat because your body doesn't want too much sugar in the system. Too much sugar in the system, you, you pass out. Too little sugar in your system, you pass out. So blood sugar is tightly regulated. So the difference between, again, processed carbs and whole foods is it's that how you actually uptake them and the insulin response and how insulin sensitive your cells are. And again, if you're not very insulin sensitive, then you're insulin resistant. And so, again, this just leads to a whole more a lo a load of problems. So sometimes, again, just having whole carbs instead of processed carbs, you can still have your carbohydrates. You'll still get that kind of sugar fix, if that's what you want to call it. But again, it's healthier for your system. And as we said, like with regard to the keto diet, we have actually covered it on a previous podcast, but I think it's something that is worth revisiting just to cover the the process again, the benefits and, you know, distinguishing those good and, you know, I don't like to call them good and bad carbs, but, you know, working out your tolerance level and not... Um, stressing yourself out if you go over a certain limit and like you say working out your tolerance level um from satiety and just like general like quality of life because if you're stressing so much over what you're eating but your body tolerates it but you don't give it the option and the chance to know whether it does 
then that's worse than the actual food that you're eating. So I think I think we should revisit the keto, don't you? Yeah, I'll let me see if we do another another part. Yeah. And again, since we I think we did the one about a year or so ago on it, but things are evolving, and yeah. we've I've been reading some more stuff about it, and we've got uh, some slightly different perspectives on it. And uh, yeah, we'll revisit the keto one in a in the next month or so, and might even get my see if we can get my brother Chris involved and. I don't know how to do an interview with him. No, you'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll that's figure that's it your out. job, and I'll yeah. just organise it. So if you're you listening, Chris, then just, <laughs> just prepare yourself that you're probably going to be on our podcast on that one. Again. <laughs> so we've got time for one more. And again, this one irks me. So it's it's all, again, back to the, sorry, sorry, ladies, but back to the females again, that lifting makes women bulky. Cupcakes make women bulky. Yeah, being overweight makes women bulky. <laughs> lifting, meh, not necessarily. Again, women should lift fairly heavy weights for their, uh, for their, with their exercise. And again, not to the point of injury. And again, if you're not lifting heavy at the minute, five pounds is your limit, then you need to build up to eights, to tens, to twelves, to, to fifteens with certain exercises and work on that. Because again, especially from the osteoporosis point of view, you should be, uh, again, lifting fairly heavy weights. I've got a client and she turned turn 60 this year and she we use the hex bar down at the gym and she does bodyweight deadlifts. And I mean, she goes to work and if the conversation ever pops up, you know what I mean? She's, uh, oh yeah, I, I, I do bodyweight deadlifts and they're kind of, what's a bodyweight deadlift? Well, I can't remember what she weighs now, 150 pound or something. So she puts 150 pound on the bar and lifts it does three or four reps and does them very well. And again, she's 60. What? nothing wrong with that. She she does it, you know, and then you see some 60-year-olds and they're, they're gripping two five-pound weights like it's going to, you know, be the death of them. And I mean, she's not got to 150-pound deadlifts just by doing it. We had to build up from a, a low-weight partial deadlift and then work at it. But I mean, it was a goal of hers to do. And there's nothing wrong with it. Bulky? No, she's not bulky. But she's fit. She's fit for her age and does mountain climbing and other things. So I mean, yeah, she's not. She's not an outlier when it comes to this. It's something that can be done. So no, lifting heavier weights won't make women bulky. It just makes them stronger. Cupcakes make women bulky. You said that. I know. But you just reiterating. I, just, I was just reiterating. The, reiterating it. that yeah, point. Yeah, cupcakes will make you big. <laughs> <laughs> the list is a little longer than we've actually got through, so we may revisit this uh, list in a couple of weeks' time and just finish it off. But for now, we're going to sign off on the, from the Healthy Half Hour. Next week... I don't know. What are we going to do next week? I don't week? know. There was blank looks all around there. Oh. Um, Let's look at the protein sparing modified fast. Yeah, and I just want to like... just uh, We had a message on our Healthy Half Hour podcast um, on Facebook and... Somebody uh, sent us a message saying, I've been listening and really love your approach to health and wellness. Thanks for making a difference in the world. And that was like really sweet. So I replied to it. But it's just nice because... What was her name? First name? Uh, Renee. Aww, so, thank you, Renee. Yeah, so it was really nice because we do appreciate feedback and we we do like to know that, you know, we, we're doing something like that people enjoyed listening to. So, And as we say it before at the end, if you've got any topics you want us to cover, yeah. either shoot us one on the Facebook page, Healthy Half Hour Podcast, or questions at healthyhalfhourpodcast.com. And we will see you next time. That's all we have time for right now, but we do hope that you join us for our next show. And if you want to contribute to an upcoming show by suggesting a topic that you would like us to discuss in more detail, then hop over to our website, healthyhalfhourpodcast.com, subscribe to our podcast and submit your suggestions. The Healthy Half Hour Podcast was brought to you by The 7 Day Shred, and don't forget to share our details with your friends and review our show. Until next time, thanks for listening.